you all for coming out this morning um, to hear about this very cheerful topic. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot lately about the end of the universe, um, the ultimate destruction of all reality, and what's the, what that's going to look like, and how we can find out what's coming. Um, and part of the reason that, that I'm thinking about that is because I'm writing a book. Uh, so you should all buy this book when it comes out <laughs> in 2020. It's called uh, The End of Everything. Um, I have to mention that. I'm sort of co contractually obliged. But uh, anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm going to start with a poem. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. This is the famous poem by Robert Frost from 1920. Of course, we know the answer now. It's fire. It's definitely fire. The world will end in fire. In <laughs> only a few million years, actually, the, the sun will have expanded and, uh, and heated up enough to boil off the oceans of the Earth, make, leaving the Earth a lifeless, charred husk of rock. Um, after that, the sun will expand uh, even farther. It'll engulf the orbits of uh, Mercury and Venus. Um, probably the Earth will spiral in at some point around there. It'll slough off the outer layers. The Earth will end in fire. It will be definitely fire dead. Um, OK, but that's, you know, that's just the Earth. It's a few billion years. Um, I'm more interested in this. I'm a cosmologist. I study the universe. I'm interested in how all of this will end. This is a, an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, a beautiful view of our cosmos with uh, tens of thousands of galaxies visible here. Like Each one of these little tiny dots is a galaxy, a collection of millions or billions of stars, uh, possibly with their own planets and civilizations. Who knows? Um, I want to know how this is all going to come to an end. OK. so. In this talk, I'm going to go through a few possibilities. So we've got the big crunch, heat death, big rip, and vacuum decay. I'll talk about those four. Now, in preparing for this talk, I thought I should um, take a little public survey and see how people feel about all of these. <laughs> so I went on Twitter and asked which, which of these scenarios would, would be more personally rewarding for, for the audience. And, um, and I got 4,000 responses, and they, they chose wrong, OK? So 37% preferred the big crunch, um, which is not the right answer. I've, really, the vacuum decay, so much cooler, and you'll see why. Um, but anyway, I thought I should let you know. Uh, so we'll start with the big crunch. OK, so this is a sort of old idea. This is one of the least likely ways for the universe to come to an end, as far as we know from our current physics. But um, Back in like the 80s and 90s, it was it was thought to be you know reasonably probable, and, and basically what happened was we were looking at the, out at the universe, and we're noticing that you know the the galaxies are moving apart from each other. The universe is expanding. Okay, um, the idea is that the Big Bang happened, something happened that started off the expansion of the universe, and since then uh, the universe has been getting bigger and bigger, and the way it gets bigger is that the galaxies and the things in the universe get farther apart from each other. Oops. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, as that happens, um, basically the empty space in between galaxies is getting larger. And so we looked at, out at the universe and we saw um, the expansion of the universe and we thought, OK, so what's going to happen next? Is it going to keep expanding forever or is it going to turn around at some point? And the, the question there is between the balance between the sort of expansion set off by the Big Bang and the gravity of all of the stuff in the universe. And, and we didn't know the answer. And so for a long time, it was thought that after a while, you know, the, the expansion will go for a while, and then it'll start to reverse, and the galaxies will start to come together again and um, get more and more uh, compact. And then at some point in the, the distant future, you'll have a situation where galaxies are, are sort of crowding in and, and the universe is becoming a more compact space. And what you would see uh, as that happens is you would start to see more uh, collisions of galaxies. And we see collisions of galaxies all over the sky. We see galaxies coming together with, the gra with their gravity and getting mixed up. And um, So this is the, one of the first things that would happen if the universe were going to do a big crunch, if it were going to all come back together. 
Um, and although it's unlikely now that the big crunch will happen, uh, we do get a bit of a taste of that in a few billion years because uh, this, this galaxy here is coming right for us. Uh, so this is the Andromeda galaxy. Um, it's uh, probably a little bit more massive than our galaxy, although there's some debate about whether or not it might be closer to the same than we thought. Um, and it's coming for us uh, at about 110 kilometers per second. And in about four billion years, it will collide with, with our Milky Way. Um, and it'll be really cool to see when that happens. I mean, we'll all be dead, obviously. Uh, the Earth will be dead. Uh, but maybe, you know, maybe we can leave like a little webcam or something. Um, and, and this is what that, that webcam would see, something like this. So, so we'd see the, the galaxy come closer. It would um, start to interact with our galaxy. You'd get this. In this picture, you see all this sort of red, uh, this red, these red blobs. You get a lot of star formation as the as the gas and dust of those galaxies come together and form new stars. Um, it might ignite the black holes in the centers of the galaxies. You get stuff pouring into the black holes and create jets coming out of the black holes in the centers of the galaxies. Really cool. Um, and in the end, you'd end up with a sort of less interesting blob of of uh, stars as, after it all sort of settles down. But the, the thing about this is that this is probably not going to really mess up the solar system. I mean, the Earth will be dead, but, but it'll still be around, you know, and the, the planets will still be around the sun, and, and the sun will be okay because when galaxies collide, generally the stars move right past each other. There's so much empty space, even in galaxies. Um, but the Big Crunch isn't like that because with the Big Crunch, yeah, the galaxies come together and stuff, but the other thing that happens is that all of the radiation from the stars and all of the radiation left over from the Big Bang starts to get compressed in a smaller and smaller space as the universe is condensing. And so one of the really cool things that you learn when you study the Big Crunch is what you learn what kills the stars. And that is, okay, so, you know, this is a picture of our sun um, from uh, in, in May. You can look at pictures of the sun like real time on the internet now, which is kind of amazing, these amazing images from these uh, satellites. What kills the, the stars in the Big Bang, in the Big Crunch, is that the radiation um, gets so strong just in the universe, in the ambient space in the universe, that it ignites the surfaces of the stars. And, and the surfaces of the stars themselves sort of detonate. At that point, the planets, are, you know, there's no hope, but, um, but it, would be, it would be really cool, it's just everything would sort of catch fire. Okay, so, so that's probably not gonna happen. Uh, the most likely thing is actually the heat death, based on what we know about the universe right now. And the idea behind the heat death is that, you know, the universe is expanding, um, and it's gonna keep expanding, and keep expanding, and keep expanding, because there's something in the universe that's making the universe expand faster. Um, there's something that's balancing out the gravity of all the stuff pulling the, the universe together and balancing it out um, and overbalancing it. There's, there's something in the universe that makes the universe expand faster. We call it dark energy. We don't know what it is, um, but whatever it is, it's sort of stretching out the space between galaxies and it's, it's coming to dominate the universe. And as it goes, as it continues to expand the universe, each galaxy will get more and more isolated until eventually um, our galaxy, our little group of galaxies, the, the sort of conglomeration of us and Andromeda uh, left over in trillions and trillions of years will be alone in the cosmos because everything else will be so far away, pulled away by the expansion of the universe that we won't be able to see it anymore. Um, and so each little island of structure will be isolated and eventually the stars will burn out and the particles will decay, the black holes will evaporate, and everything will just kind of fade to black. That's called the heat death. Um, it's called the heat death because the, the, the term heat in that, in that term uh, actually comes from the idea of disordered energy. So as the particles decay um, and as the universe becomes empty, all that's left is a little bit of sort of a tiny background of radiation at uh, something like 10 to the minus 40 kelvins, very, very cold background of radiation that's just uniform throughout the, the universe, just heat. And you can't do anything with uniformly distributed heat. 
And so all structure will end, all uh, order will end, and it'll just be this maximum entropy state of nothingness. Um, so that's, that's the heat death, and that, that assumes a cosmological constant. So, um, cause it, it, I, I tell you this because it could get worse. Um, so, so a cosmological constant is this idea that Einstein came up with um, as a way to balance out the gravity of everything in the universe because when Einstein, in Einstein's time, he thought the universe was static. And so he knew that all the galaxies are pulling on each other, so they should just all come together. There should be an immediate big crunch. And so he had to put in something in the equations to balance that out. And so he put in something called the cosmological constant that could kind of push everything away and keep it static. And when he found out that the universe was expanding, he got rid of that term. Uh, but now we need something to push the galaxies to make them expand faster and faster. And so it's called a cosmological constant. And the thing about a cosmological constant, the, the constant part is the density. So if you have the density of stuff in the universe versus time, you know, the, the density of matter goes down as the universe is expanding. The density of radiation goes down even faster. But the cosmological constant just stays constant. If you have a, a box this big, it's full of cosmological constant, and you make it twice as big, now you have twice as much cosmological constant. It's weird stuff. Um, but what that means is that over time, it'll just completely dominate the universe, and there'll be really nothing left aside from, from the cosmological constant, because everything else gets diluted and it doesn't. Um, but that's for, for a cosmological constant, a particular kind of dark energy, but there are other kinds of dark energy that that don't do this sort of flat thing, they, uh, they actually kind of go up over time. And that's called phantom dark energy. And that leads to something called a big rip. Now, a big rip is worse than the heat death because in a big rip, when the galaxies are being pulled apart from each other, there's so much dark energy in the universe, it's so powerful that it doesn't just remove, it doesn't just make the galaxies more distant from each other, it starts to expand them from within. Like currently in, in the expansion of the universe as we understand it, we're not getting any bigger, but the universe around us, the spaces between things are getting bigger. In a big rip, in a phantom dark energy universe, um, leading to a big rip, the, the sort of bonds that hold together structure would themselves be overcome by the dark energy. Because in a big rip universe, in a phantom dark energy universe, you have box of phantom dark energy, you make that box twice as big, now you have more than twice as much dark energy. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a, a lovely um, illustration that NASA made of what would happen in a big rip that, that I really like. So you have the expansion, and then, <laughs> and then the galaxies get pulled apart. Um, now, uh, just, just to, to give you an idea of how we study this, there's, there's a parameter that we study um, having to do with the balance of density and pressure of the stuff made in the universe called the equation of state parameter, this W. And I tell you this because um, the cosmological constant gives you a W equals exactly minus one. That's how you define a cosmological constant, or that's it's one of the properties of it. The, the pressure and the density sort of exactly balance each other in this, uh, written in this way. Um, and phantom dark energy is a cosmological constant of anything at all less than minus one. So, so a cosmological constant is exactly that number. Anything at all less than that number is phantom dark energy, destroys the universe of the big rip. Um, so when the, when the big rip was first sort of hypothesized, uh, they, there was a, a really amazing paper that came out that calculated um, exactly what would happen when if the, if you had a W of, let's say, minus three halves, okay, just as, a, as an example. And so they made this, this uh, timeline of doom. Um, so they, they start with like, the things that have already happened, you know, galaxies form, atoms form, and then you know, they, they figure out that the big rip would be at 35 billion years from the beginning of the universe, and so one billion years before that, galaxy clusters go away, 60 million years before Milky Way is gone, and then things speed up a lot, three months before the solar system is unbound, 30 minutes before the Earth explodes, and then 10 to the minus 19 seconds, right before the end, the, uh, the atoms are dissociated and everything is ripped apart. And the universe is destroyed um, during, during this big rip. But that's for, that's for uh, three halves, uh, W equals three halves, which is a really, a really large 
uh, negative number. Um, and we can calculate, we can uh, measure W by doing things like we have this, this Planck satellite that's looking at the cosmic microwave background, the, the afterglow of the Big Bang itself, and studying the properties of that. Um, and we can measure W to, to a great precision with, with these kinds of measurements combined with others. And um, what we're hoping for is W equals exactly minus one. What we actually measure is that. So a little bit less than minus one, but within the error bars, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's minus one within the error of the measurement so far. But it, it, the, the best fit value is actually a little bit less. Um, but it's okay, because the, if the big rip is coming, it's not coming for a very long time. Um, we have at least 120 billion years <laughs> before we have to worry about this. So, so you can rest easy. Um, it'll, it'll be a while. Um, and this, you know, we're constantly refining this number, so, so we don't really know yet. Um, but that, that's a big rip. But the, but the last one, vacuum decay, is cool because it could happen at any time, <laughs> technically. <laughs> um, so, so this is an idea that's it's been around for a while, I think at least since the, the 70s or 80s. Um, and it's this idea that, uh, that, that um, the universe could kind of destroy itself in a, in a sort of bubble of quantum death. I'll, I'll explain that. Um, so, so it's been a while, it's this, it's this idea that there's more than one kind of state of the cosmos, it's the state of the fundamental vacuum of space, and we could transition between those two states, possibly. Um, and for a while it was sort of just this, this um, curiosity in, in the equations, but then something happened, which is that we discovered the Higgs boson. Um, this is, the large, this is an event display from the Large Hadron Collider showing you know, uh, protons smashed together, create this debris, it's measured by, uh, by these detectors, and we learn about the standard model of particle physics, we learn about the properties of subatomic particles, and we discovered the Higgs boson, this sort of final missing piece of our best model of particle physics yet, the standard model. Um, and when we discovered it, it told us that, that vacuum decay is possible. Um, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But let me just start with the standard model. Okay, this is, this is the standard model of particle physics. Um, it's a beautiful set of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a theory that, that tells us what's, what the particles of the universe are. And it's, it's been fantastically um, successful in predicting all kinds of experiments and interactions. Um, and it's got a set of particles plus that one, the Higgs boson, uh, discovered in 2012, very exciting. Uh, so I'll just walk you through what these are. So there's the, the quarks, these are the purple ones. The quarks are particles that are constituents of protons and neutrons. So if you take two up quarks and a down quark, you get a proton, two down quarks and an up quark, you get a neutron. Then there's the green ones here, the leptons. Um, these are the, the electron. Uh, and the neutrinos. Uh, the electron, of course, is the thing that goes around the um, nucleus of an atom, although once you learn quantum field theory and stuff, you learn it's more of a sort of cloud of electron probabilityness and wave functions and things, but it's a, it's a sort of constituent of, of the atom. On the right there, the red, those are the gauge bosons. These are things that are responsible for the fundamental forces of nature. So you have the photon that does the electromagnetic force, the gluon that holds things together inside, um, inside nuclei. It's, it's the thing that does the strong force, the strong nuclear force. Then there's the W and the Z bosons that do the uh, weak force, the weak nuclear force. And by studying the properties of all of these particles, the, the standard model of particle physics, we can learn about the, um, the fundamental nature of the cosmos, the fundamental nature of the, the sort of universal vacuum in which we live. And specifically by measuring the Higgs boson and the top quark, we can learn something about that. And so we can make this graph. Um, this is a graph from 2012, shortly after the, the Higgs boson was discovered. And for different uh, values of the Higgs mass and the top quark mass, you end up in regions of stability or instability or places where the equations don't make sense. And what we found by measuring these numbers is that we're, we're right there. So that's, that's a metastable spot. That means that the universe is stable for now, at the moment. 
but it's not stable forever. It's sort of an unstable equilibrium. And what that, what that means in terms of, you know, what it, it, here's a, a sort of schematic of what that means. Okay, so this is a, a schematic of two different states of the universe, where each state gives you different sort of laws of physics, different constants of nature. Okay, and you can think of it as these are little valleys in some energy space, and you know, we live in one of these valleys, valleys right? And the higher one is the false vacuum, the lower one is the true vacuum, because the false vacuum is sort of the less stable state, and the true vacuum is where things are much more stable because it's lower energy, um, and that's sort of where everything would settle, right? So what that plot showed us, that, that metastable uh, state, means that we're in a false vacuum, which means that if you had a high enough energy event happen somewhere in the universe, it could, it could kick us right over into the true vacuum. And that would be bad, um, because the true vacuum has different constants of nature than the false vacuum. Constants of nature are things like the, uh, the charge of the electron, or the mass of the particles, or even the, the strength of gravity sometimes. And, and so, so if you take the, the molecules that you're made of and you put them into a true vacuum state, those molecules don't hold together anymore. Total destruction, right? Um, but luckily, the energy it would take to kick us over that hill is just phenomenal, right? Like way higher than any kind of energy we can make with, uh, with a collider, um, way higher than any particle collisions we've ever heard of, um, just, just totally unreachable, that energy. So you might think, okay, we're safe. Like technically we're in a, true va in a false vacuum, but we can't possibly get over that hill. Um, unfortunately, uh, the universe is also fundamentally quantum mechanical, which means that if you're, if you're over here in one little valley, you can just like quantum tunnel right over to the other one, which means that at any point in space, there's some probability that at that point in that time, there will be some little quantum event that will kick that little bit of space into the true vacuum. And because the true vacuum is a lower energy state, it's sort of preferable, which means that that little bit of true vacuum will want to expand. So what that looks like, so let's say you have this, this event happens over here, you get this bubble of true vacuum expanding through the universe. And it's expanding at the speed of light. And this, this bubble wall has some kind of energy associated with it, the energy it would take to get over that hill, which means that the bubble wall, if it comes at you, would just incinerate you immediately. And because it's expanding at the speed of light, if, if you're over here, like you're not going to see it's coming. <laughs> There's just no way. And then once it passes, you know, it incinerates you, and then it creates this, this true vacuum, everything falls apart, and a total destruction, right? Um, so this, this idea has been around for a while, as I said, and there's, there's a paper from 1980 by Coleman and Delucia, which, which I really like, because it, it has this, this beautiful piece of physics poetry in it, and I, I want to share it with you. Now, this, this, um, in this paper, just before this, this bit that I'll quote you, they went through and they calculated what would happen to that bubble of true vacuum once it forms. And they calculated that in the model they were working with, um, that, that bubble of true vacuum, once it forms, would be gravitationally unstable, and it would just collapse completely. So first, you know, first there's the wall of destruction, and then there's, there's the atoms that can't hold together, and then total collapse. Um, and so, and so they, they, they did those calculations, and then they say, this is disheartening. <laughs> they say, the possibility that we are living in a false vacuum has never been a cheering one to contemplate. Vacuum decay is the ultimate ecological catastrophe. In a new vacuum, there are not only, there are new constants in nature. After the vacuum decay, not only is life as we know it impossible, so is chemistry as we know it. However, one could always draw stoic comfort from the possibility that perhaps in the course of time, the new vacuum would sustain, if not life as we know it, at least some structures capable of knowing joy. <laughs> This possibility has now been eliminated. <laughs> so, 
so I should say that you know those calculations from the 80s, there, there are some uncertainties in that. And it's possible that, that the new vacuum would not immediately collapse uh, once it forms. Um, it's probably still not possible we could survive in it, but you know some structure is capable of knowing joy. Um, but, there, but there are a couple of reasons that you really shouldn't worry about vacuum decay. Um, aside from the obvious, there's nothing you could do about it. You wouldn't see it coming. Um, also, it's not like anybody's going to miss you. It's the whole universe. It's gone. So like, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but aside from that, you know, these calculations, uh, the, the idea that we're living in a metastable state come from careful measurements of the standard model of particle physics. And, and although the standard model of particle physics has been massively successful in terms of all of the experiments we've ever done, everything we've ever seen, um, we know it's not the whole story. Because when we look at sort of a pie chart of what the universe is made of, we see that most of the universe is dark energy. And dark energy does not fit in the standard model of particle physics. It's not part of that picture. It's something else. And then most of the matter in the universe is dark matter, which also does not fit in the standard model of particle physics. We don't have a particle in that picture that makes the dark matter that we, that we observe. The, the invisible stuff that holds galaxies together doesn't seem to be in that, in that model. The entire standard model of particle physics lives here in this little 4.9% slice of the universe that we can even remotely understand. So everything that we've ever observed and all of these calculations are based on this little bit that, that we can do experiments with. So maybe there's something in the rest of this that says that we're not going to, at any moment, transition to true vacuum state. Maybe there's some kind of thing that, that'll tell us that, that there's some other possibility for how the universe will end. That, that, that you know, maybe it'll be some other really interesting story. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I'm working on trying to understand the rest of this pie chart um, and uh, figuring out sort of what it all means and where we're going. So thank you. Um, I, I think we have time for some questions. If, uh, if we want, if anybody has questions about the universe and we're all going. Uh, so did, are there better endings from, uh, from the research and this other stuff? Um, I mean, it depends on what you mean by better. Um, I, I mean, unfortunately, there, there doesn't seem to be any scenario that's, that's seriously discussed in the literature that has the universe not end, right? So, so, so like, there doesn't seem to be anything, any way for, for things to just keep going. Um, and, and given that, you know, it's not, it's not going to end well. Um, but, but there are other possibilities for things, that, for things outside of these, these four that I talked about. One of the ones that's discussed a lot is the idea that, that we live on a kind of uh, a brain, which is a brain is like short for membrane. It's a kind of a, 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 li a limited space. Uh, and then there's another one. Uh, separated from us by a higher dimensional space, and then they could like collide, and then come apart again, and then collide again. You have this like cyclic model of collisions of, of different brains across this higher dimensional space, um, and that's something that that we might learn more about by studying dark dark energy. Maybe dark matter has something to do with um, with one of these things, uh, but I mean mostly. Mostly the name of the game is, is studying how the universe is expanding, trying to get a better model of quantum gravity, uh, something that unites the theories of gravity with the theories of the fundamental particles so that we know what, what these things are. And then that might tell us more about the structure of the larger universe. But, um, but I, haven't, I haven't seen anything that, that, that gives us like a gentle, uh, a gentle end. So it's, 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 it's going to be unpleasant. I think no matter which way it goes. You mentioned black holes evaporating. Yes. What's that? Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Okay, um, so 
Okay, so this is, this is an idea that came from Stephen Hawking, actually. Um, the idea is that, so a black hole is, is you know, the remnant of a star that's collapsed on itself and created this kind of singularity in space where nothing can escape from it. The, you'd have to move tra faster than the speed of light to escape from a black hole. You can't do that. Um, but Stephen Hawking calculated that there's, um, there's this way in which sort of quantum mechanical effects on the edge of the black hole can create particles um, sort of out of the vacuum, in a sense, that can leave the black hole and carry away some of its mass. Um, and this is called Hawking radiation. And so basically, all black holes at, have some radiation that comes off of them um, at some tiny level. It's, it gets brighter as the black hole gets smaller. Um, but that kind of carries away the mass of these black holes. And so if you leave, if you leave a black hole alone long enough, um, it will eventually radiate so much that it will disappear. Um, but it'll take a really long time. So black holes that are something like 10 to the 15 grams, so about the mass of a mountain, if they were formed at the very beginning of the universe, they would just now be evaporating. So it takes, it takes a while. And more massive black holes would take longer to evaporate. Um, so, so that's something that's, that's been um, talked about for a while. Fun fact about black hole evaporation is that um, there have been some recent papers showing that, that as black holes are evaporating, if they're, if they're small enough to be doing that, um, just before they completely disappear, they might trigger vacuum decay and destroy the universe. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it may be that, you know, that if you leave a black hole long enough, it destroys the, the universe. We, we don't know yet, but um, I'm working on a paper about that at the moment. So it's kind of fun. So, um, Um, what are some differences between cosmic inflation and uh, the Big Rip? Because they're both very, they seem to be both processes where the universe expands very quickly or out of control. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, so cosmic inflation is, there's, there have been a lot of comparisons between cosmic inflation and dark energy, uh, uh, the sort of dark energy dominated universe. So a cosmic inflation universe is one in which the universe is expanding very rapidly in very much the same way that a universe dominated by dark energy would expand rapidly. But, um, but the, the Big Rip is a slightly different situation in, which it, in that it's, it's a more powerful expansion. Uh, it's a, whatever, is, uh, uh, whatever it is that's, that's causing a Big Rip, if it happens, this phantom dark energy would be, um, would be different from what we imagine inflation to, to be a, and sort of more destructive. But, um, but I should say, you know, we don't, we don't know for sure that inflation happened. We don't know exactly what it did. We just, there, we have a lot of evidence that there was a rapid expansion at the beginning of the universe, um, but we don't know how it worked or what, it, what made it happen. Dark energy, yes. dark matter, yeah. it's out there. Why isn't it here? Uh, so, so it, it, yeah, dark matter, if it's out there, is here. Um, it's passing through us all the time. Um, the, the amount of dark energy uh, that we would have in this room would be about, about a, a third the mass of a proton per cubic centimeter. And it would be passing through us right now at something like a couple hundred kilometers a second um, as the Earth moves through the solar system and through the galaxy. So, so the idea is that the, the galaxy is kind of embedded in this sort of cloud of dark matter, and, and we're moving through it all the time. Um, it's just, it, it just seems to be very, very hard to detect. So whatever the dark matter is, uh, it seems to be a kind of particle that doesn't interact easily with the kind of materials we use for detectors. It has mass, so if you get a lot of it together, it can be very important gravitationally. Um, but it doesn't seem to do much in terms of the sort of particle interactions, at least not to the level that we've detected. In terms of dark energy, it would also be here, but the, en the, the density of it is also very small. And so it's only in spaces where uh, the density of everything else is very, very low that it, it can be sort of important. Quick yes. question. So if time varies in space time based on gravity and acceleration, throughout the universe, mm -hmm. how do you have one reference of time that you're saying like, oh, this will happen in 10 billion years or, or something like that? Um, so in the, the sort of speed at which time passes um, 
can vary depending on where you are and what you're doing and stuff like that. Um, but uh, when, I, when I say something like, you know, 120 billion years from now, uh, I'm, I'm referencing specifically the time as we would measure it on Earth, but also it, there are very few situations in which it makes much of a difference at all um, how, how quickly time passes, especially since that 120 billion years is a very rough number. Um, and so, it's, uh, so in, in most cases, for cosmic time scales, uh, those things um, tend, not to, uh, tend not to really factor in. Um, but if you're, if you're doing sort of precision things, or if you're talking about you know, being really close to a black hole versus not, then it, then it can make a really big difference. I think maybe like one more question. Okay, so the um, question is, W, you told us about minus one or a little bit less than minus one. Yeah. But the error bars allow a little bit greater than minus one. Yeah. What happens then? Yeah, so, so, that's, yeah, so that's another possibility. Um, so that number W, uh, if it's anything less than a third, uh, that, sorry, if there's anything less than minus one third, um, then you get accelerated expansion. Um, and so a cosmological constant is exactly minus one. Um, Anything between that and minus a third is, is just accelerated expansion driven by something else um, that would also give you uh, something like a heat death. Uh, below minus one third gives you a big rip. Um, and, but, and so there are a lot of, I, I should say also, that W is sort of assuming that it's constant, uh, that the, the, the W number is constant. Um, there are kinds of dark energy that change over time uh, where the dark energy might sort of not be doing anything for a while and then it might turn on at some point or um, there are even models where dark energy and dark matter interact with these, each other in some ways. Um, so there are a lot of different possibilities. Um, but for simplicity, if, you, if, if each one has just a, a, a constant W, then, um, then anything between you know, it, from, from minus a third or lower would give you the kind of expansion that, that we see. Um, I, think, I think maybe I need to finish up. Um, but, uh, yeah, okay, well, thank you. <laughs>